Today we're going to be reviewing The Will of the Many by James Islington, the first book of the Hierarchy series. I don't know if it's going to be a trilogy or what. I got this book for free from the publisher for the purpose of review. I'm going to give you an honest review. I entered this book with moderately low expectations. I've read the first two books of the Lycanius trilogy, also by this author, and I thought they were perfectly acceptable books, but nothing to really to write home about. As a result, entering this, I came with low expectations, and my expectations were blown away. This book was really good. I'll start off with by telling you what to expect. Com I'd compare this to Red Rising by Pierce Brown with The Codex Solera by Jim Butcher. By that I mean this is a coming-of-age story of, in a Roman setting, there is a magic academy, and there is also, the character has to learn how to use a magic system. So what's this book actually about? What's its target audience? That sort of thing. Roman fantasy, political scheming, uh, this political scheming takes many forms, including Rome versus a rebellion against a Roman-style nation, uh, military versus religion versus government. Those are the three different branches of this Republic Empire. And then finally, there is a sub-theme of betrayal and betraying. This book takes place at a magic academy and the various students. It's a killer be killer atmosphere where to, for one student to progress, other students have to fail. So... The protagonist doesn't know who to trust at any particular time. This book is targeted for adults, but I think someone who's 15 plus can safely read this. I'd say this is very high high magic, meaning there's lots of magic in this. And finally, the last 15 pages of this are a battle royale. Going back to Red Rising, this book was clearly inspired by Red Rising. Can't blame him, that's a great book. But only the last 15% of this book is a battle royale versus like 50% of that book was a battle royale. What is a battle royale? A battle royale is when different characters fight to off against one another with a, in a winner-take-all sort of situation. Like think of the Humberger Grames or think of Red Rising. Only 15% of this book is that, so if you don't particularly, that doesn't sound particularly interested to you, don't worry, it's very short. Finally, it's light military fantasy, so there's not much like swords or clashing, like that sort of thing. And it has a slow start. And finally, this book uses the trope of lost civilizations and the heroes have to go reclaim the lost technology. So if that sounds interesting to you, it's there. And finally, it does invert some tropes. Uh, not too many, but it does invert some of them. I give this book four out of five stars, meaning it's like within, it's really good, at least by my how I grade books. What's this book's concept? Uh, a prince in hiding is a war orphan who's recruited by a rebel faction to go fight an evil empire which killed his royal dynasty. Uh, basically, you could say this is something like Belgariad or Shannara, but the it's not really, this is actually a twist when you actually consider the fact that the empire is not led by an evil dark lord, it's led by a republic and a senate. So what the protagonist has to do, he has to go undercover, become a member of the rebellion, and go to this academy. If he graduates from this academy, he'll become a senator in the Senate, and he'll be able to destroy the empire from within. That's the general plan. This book one is about getting into the academy and passing and that sort of thing. In addition to this, there is a subplot of the heroes are trying to get into ancient tombs and dungeons left behind by a precursor race of technologically advanced Atlantean sort of things. No one really knows why these things are there. They're trying to find ancient artifact weapons, that sort of thing. I felt that this concept was well executed upon, but I had a few quibbles. Um, I referenced Red Rising repeatedly up to now. That's because the comparisons are obvious. And that said, I think this book compares favorably to Red Rising. Okay, so I'll start with a with the necessary preamble. A lot of people who read like the Lycanius trilogy came away with a negative impression of the characters in that I was also one of them. I personally felt the characters in Lycanius were by and large cardboard. They are improved here. I like them quite a bit. They had subtle, nuanced portrayals of characterization. For example, they had distinct personalities, distinct speech patterns, and what drive them were distinct based upon their geographic origin or their personal histories, that sort of thing. That wasn't really the case in the Lycanius trilogy, which makes this a much better book to my eyes. I'll start out with the protagonist, Diago. At first, I didn't love him. At first, I thought he was a kind of generic chosen one, orphan farm boy, 
footprints sort of thing. But rapidly, the story develops nuance. Like I said, there is no Dark Lord to destroy, so in order for the protagonist to succeed, he has to become a senator in this evil empire, and in order to do that, he has to become basically evil himself. He has to become so evil that he can pass through Evil Academy and become an evil senator. I felt this is a very compelling idea. It was well implemented. Now, I will say one thing. This book is a power fantasy. Now, what is a power fantasy? Basically, the trope of a power fantasy is the hero is the strongest, smartest, most powerful person who ever existed. Uh, he instantly becomes perfect at everything he attempts. He's hyper competent. You will probably know this by the word Mary Sue. Looking at it from a narrative dis direction, the author did not include those uh, training sequences to make him so perfect because he wanted to save time, and I think that's a valid reason. This is a classic power fantasy. If you want to read that, check it out. If you want to read a zero to hero book like Unsold or something like that, this ain't it. Move along. Finally, I enjoyed Diago when he was out of his element. Um, as stated, he was a student at school, and when he was there, he was in his element. He was really smart. He's smarter than everyone else around him. He was cunning. He's strategizing. He's making master plans. And then he had to go home to his destroyed kingdom, and he suddenly got really depressed. He became really introspective. He crushed in on himself. He became deeply emotional. He became sad, and it was a really interesting thing to read because this was a strong and powerful character who's brought to his knees by the fact that he's confronted with his family's deaths. He has to come to terms with the fact that he's trying to make friends with the people who killed his family and he's trying to become like them and he's beginning to hate himself because he's actually succeeding in becoming like them. It was really great reading. It was a genius idea of the author. It worked very well. I enjoyed the protagonist, Diago. If I were to add a caveat, his character arc feels incomplete, but that makes sense. This is book one in a series. Now, a brief word about the protagonist friends, Calidus and Eidhen. I hope I spoke that correctly. Calidus is a super smart slacker archetype who's going to school to please his family, but really has no passion for education himself. I've never seen that in fiction. I thought it was well written. Aidhin is a noble savage who's going to magic school to prove his people aren't barbarians to the people who conquered him. Basically, this could have been handled poorly, but it wasn't. When you use the noble savage trope, that's usually a bit racist. But in this case, it's in reference to the fact that this book is about Rome. The noble savages in this case are Celts. Aidhin is an Irish name. So specifically, we're talking about Celts, meaning that the racist card doesn't really get played in this case. I thought it was well done. Specifically, I like the fact that both Diago and Aidhin are from the same ethnic group. They're both Celts. So they both developed a friendship together in the academy. They cooperated, they became good friends, and they had to deal with racism from the their instructors together. I like the fact that Aidhin and Diago were from different like sub-ethnicities of the shared Celtic her heritage. Uh, they both, they're like the same people, but like they had emotion, they clashed with one another. That was well done. Finally, this book had two sets of antagonists, the evil hierarchy empire and the Anguis rebelling against them. The Anguis are righteous in their cause, but they're ca taking it way too far. And not only are they taking it way too far, but they're failing and they're killing people for no reason. I liked this. These characters were clearly, they were on the right track of being good people, but Overall, they're just assholes. Um, I don't know how else to put it. I like them as antagonists. They're using the protagonist as their pawn. Well written because they were hypocrites. The hierarchy uses this magic system. Quick explanation. The magic system is called the will, and it's basically evil. And the Anguis really hate the magic system. However, they're hypocrites because in order to beat their enemy, they started using their enemy's tool, the will. Uh, I liked the fact that the Anguis were hypocrites in this way. Pacing wise, this book had a slow start. Uh, I'll just admit the truth. The This is a magic school suit book. The magic school doesn't begin until the 35% mark. That's a long time to wait for the wait for the main plot to actually begin. There is a few very interesting scenes in between there, particularly the Nomica scene uh, occurs in that 35%. What is the Nomica? This is a book based on Roman history that in ancient Rome, they would flood the Colosseum in Rome and reenact naval battles in there. 
that's what the Namica was. They had a naval battle in a Roman amphitheater sort of thing. Really fun to watch. Lots of people died. Great to read. That's basically the most interesting part of the book until the 35% mark happened and that book actually began. I think that this is a mistake by the author, one author critiquing another. I think some of this should have been trimmed out or rewritten because I was just bored until the uh, action, until the magic school actually began. Let's talk about the plot for a minute. I thought the plot in Lycanius was the best part of the book or the series. I think pretty much everyone who reads that series will agree the plot is the best part of the series. I can safely say after reading this, that wasn't a fluke. The author is just really talented at plotting. The plot in this is even better than it was in Lycanius. So if you're tempted to read it merely based on the plot, that is even better, just as like the characters are better and everything like that is better. You know, getting some of the details, specifically, there's a lot of twists and turns, as you can imagine by this author if you read Lycanius. Okay, there are two main plot lines. There is the trying to graduate with honors plot line, and there's also the dungeon driving plot line. And they were entirely separated basically throughout the book. The protagonist was trying to get help from his friends to graduate with honors, but he was trying to not have any help with his, from his friends to do the dungeon diving. That was a mistake by the author. He should have had his friends help him do the dungeon diving and get ancient relics from the dungeons. That would help integrate these different characters and made it a more compelling novel overall. Let's talk about the prose. Uh, the tone struck me as a less dour Red Rising, but more serious than Codex Alera, if that makes sense to you guys. The author's prose was improved from the Lycanius trilogy, but it is still, I'll compare it to Sanderson or McClellan, it was well, I won't say dumped down, but it's like simple. It's for all audiences. I'll put it that way. I will say I do think it is improved from the Lycanius trilogy, if that matters to you guys. Now let's talk about what I really like about this book. Uh, specifically, this is a book deeply inspired by Roman history and events. Uh, for example, the, protect the author had a really good idea of combining the idea of Roman slavery uh, with a magic system. The will magic system works by... An aristocrat enslaves various people and they dominate them so much that he absorbs their willpower and gains lots of magic in the process. Uh, if I was to compare it to something, I could compare it to something like David Farland's Ruined Lord series or Brandon Sanderson's Endowments from his Cosmere. This magic system adds a tension to the story because the book is based on a deeply unjust and unethical system. There is innate tension to that specifically because the when an aristocrat wants to get stronger, they have to actively go out and take slaves and add them to like what they want. So the only way to do that is to conquer and conquer and conquer. So what happens when they run out of people to conquer? That happens in the course of this story. Basically, because they've run out of places to conquer, they now have only themselves to conquer, meaning that civil war is on the horizon. As a result of the direct consequence of how this magic system works, that was a really good idea by the author, combining the magic system with the plot and setting like that. If you actually look at Roman history, when Julius Caesar and those people went to war over the actual nation, and they fought over with one another in a series of civil wars, the book explores other aspects of Roman culture as well. For example, like I mentioned, they had the Naumaca, where they had mock naval battles inland in order to please the peasants. Um, they also have the a culture obsessed with lineage and they allow adult adoptions. They perform ritual rites to appease the dead and they use cataphracts like Byzantine Rome. Keep going, but when you read this book, you'll see that this book is deeply inspired by uh, Roman history. This is when I want to read a book inspired by ancient history or history in general. This is really what I want to see. This is well researched, this is well thought out and it combines themes uh, with actual history and just a good story. Now that said, it's not perfect. This empire is made up of three sides, the government, the military, and religion. Uh, these separate institutions control the empire. They're rivals to institutional power and they push and pull against one another for control. It's neat in concept and it's completely ahistorical. In ancient Rome, like the military was the government, the government, was the religion, the religion was the military. 
these three organizations were all linked up with one another. You can't separate them out again. So the author's setup in this book is completely ahistorical, and that's fine. Stuff happens. You're allowed to make a few mistakes if the book overall does honor to a setting. I think this book overall does honor to the setting. There's one last thing I noticed. You know the story of an ancient destroyed civilization with lots of ruins and forgotten technology and that sort of thing. Like I mentioned before, it's Atlantean is like one way to code it, but it's also, it's ancient Roman. This trope entered the canon of Western like literature as a result of the fall of the Western Roman Empire. The Western Roman Empire fell, so much technology was lost. I thought it was funny that this trope of, that originated with the fall of the Roman Empire is being replayed, but instead we're having actual Romans trying to piece the world back together again after the fall of the Roman Empire. It was just kind of funny to read, like putting the cart before the horse. It was good stuff. This is a great book. I'd honestly be reading book two right now if it was published right now. Uh, I think this is in contention for the best book I'll read this year. It probably won't be the best book, but it definitely won't be in the top 10. Okay, have a nice day.